People tend to believe some pretty weird things, uh, from NASA faking the moon landing to uh, pharmaceutical companies conspiring with government departments to keep people sick, um, and climate change, obviously. I mean, why does that happen? Why do people believe strange things like that? Well, there's a number of factors. I think one of the most important ones is that people try to preserve their worldview, their personal, deeply held beliefs about how the world should be structured, how society should be functioning. And anything that they perceive as a threat to those worldviews, they tend to reject. So, for example, in the case of climate change, we know from a lot of research that uh, the factor that is driving whether or not somebody accepts the scientific evidence on climate change is not the evidence, but it is their own personal beliefs about how society should function. And in particular, people who think that um, society should be structured hierarchically based on merit, uh, based on free market principles, they will feel uh, frightened by climate change, not because the climate is changing, but because doing something about it would require to some interference mm -hmm. with free market mechanisms, some sort of taxation, some sort of price on carbon. And all those things are inherently frightening to those uh, people. And it's, it's nothing you can trivialize because they're, they're deeply held fundamental convictions and any threat to them is met with, oh my God, and a defensive reaction. Mm -hmm. And that is when people just uh, don't look at the evidence. They look at, uh, mm. you know, preserving their worldview and being defensive about that. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the major factors. Mm -hmm. So um, people obviously have a difficult time reconciling formal data evidence uh, with their their personal experiences. I mean that that seems tricky to me, and it also seems very counterintuitive how they can look around and. and mm -hmm and see things that are staring them blankly in the face. Mm -hmm. I mean, particularly with more trivial sorts of examples like um, the moon landing or vaccinations or something like that. But how do they, how does that happen? How is it that people can um, maintain these types of uh, very counterintuitive or superstitious beliefs yeah. in some cases yeah. uh, in the face of, of really um, stark facts that suggest otherwise. Yeah. Well, um, again, what happens is that people tend to focus selectively on what they consider to be the evidence. Um, so they may focus on one data point in the case of climate change, one thermometer somewhere that has been showing cooling for the last 10 years, let's say. Hmm. That's certainly true but it is only one of about a billion different measurements that tell us that the climate is changing. And yet, by focusing on just this one convenient piece of evidence um, that is protecting people's worldview, mm -hmm. they can be absolutely convinced that they are right. Look here, there is this one thermometer, it's cooling. Yeah. Yeah. And they're ignoring absolutely everything else. Sure. And it is extremely difficult to get people to go beyond that yeah. one piece of evidence because doing so, would imply that they have to perhaps change their opinion, and that's a very difficult thing for people to do. Right. So it, on opinion change, I mean, it is a very difficult thing, uh, particularly when, uh, as you said, some things that people believe are so entrenched and yeah. they do hold very dear. What's What's the most, I mean, I, I would imagine the data alone don't change people's minds. Uh, data, you need a good story, you need something where they can hang on to their personal opinion exactly. while also accepting the new data. Yeah. Exactly, so the key thing, uh, we, we know how, how uh, we can reframe problems so that they become easier to accept uh, for people. So for example, in the case of climate change, um, we can reframe it as a business opportunity for the nuclear industry, for example, uh, rather than as a need to cut emissions or impose a tax. So, and then the very same people who will oppose uh, mitigation efforts vociferously if it involves emission cuts, they will say, yeah, actually, you know, why not go nuclear, for example. So that is a reframing that tends to work. You can also, um, convince people that climate change is a national security risk, 
uh, which it is, according to the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Pentagon is completely accepting of the science. They know the climate is changing and why it is changing. And they are developing contingency plans for that because mm -hmm. the security risks arising from that are very significant. Mm -hmm. And so people who might otherwise reject the science become more susceptible, more receptive to it. Mm -hmm. If they recognize, ah, oh, hang on, that's a threat to national security. Mm -hmm. So by focusing on different aspects of the problem, sometimes you can reframe it sure. so that people are more receptive to the evidence. Are there any things, other things that you could do to kind of help uh, reframe things? I've uh, I, I read your uh, debunking uh, handbook, yes. which is quite good in terms of uh, kind of vivid information, the, the use of infographics. Uh, the other thing Absolutely. that seems to be effective is uh, in order to bridge action, intention and action, making mm -hmm. things that are clear uh, with a very specific goal and so on? Absolutely. I mean, you've got to give people a specific goal. You've got to give them what we call a sticky message that is uh, easy to remember. Um, and not terribly complicated, so it's, it's something like uh, climate change is a health risk mm -hmm. and we can all be healthier by reducing pollution. For example, that is one uh, successful reframing that has been applied to climate change and it's perfectly true. Mm -hmm. I mean, in fact, we know that owing to pollution regulations dating back to the 1970s, life expectancy of people in industrialized parts of the United States has actually gone up by a year, mm. entirely due to a reduction of pollution. Oh, that's kind of cool to live longer. Most people are uh, uh, happy at that idea. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, by, by having a simple message like that and hammering it home, repeating it, giving people specific things they can do, like, you know, take the streetcar or the bus rather than your car, install solar panels, you know, turn the whole thing into a sequence of very easy behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, that is how you can move people along. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting things is that once people change their behavior, um, their attitudes follow suit. Right. So, um, and changing people's behavior is far easier than changing their attitudes. Mm. Yep. Interesting. Uh, one of the major drivers, I think, in, in uh, the maintenance of people's beliefs and the formation of their mm. beliefs is uh, the role of the media. Right. Now, the media <laughs> clearly plays a large role. Mm -hmm. uh, you've encountered that Absolutely. Uh, yourself? Absolutely. Um, Yes. Uh, could you tell us a bit about that? Well, that's a very uh, mixed bag and not always a nice story because um, there are, there's an abundance of evidence to suggest that certain segments of the media have done a very poor job informing the public about a number of, um, you know, different issues from the mythical weapons of mass destruction mm -hmm. in Iraq to climate change. Um, so the media are culpable to some extent in providing an information landscape that isn't always reliable, mm -hmm. to put it mildly. Um, and and that, that is a serious problem, uh, especially now that we have the ability for people to choose their own media in a sense by focusing on certain sources on the internet. Um, information has become far more fragmented. Mm. People have become more immersed in their own sort of bubble mm -hmm. of information they like. Mm -hmm. And that is what they're consuming to the exclusion of everything else. And there's a lot of research done on that, that people have become more encapsulated, more polarized in general mm -hmm. um, for that reason, mm -hmm. because people follow their own instincts and they want to hear things that they like. Mm -hmm. And so they're drifting further apart depending on their initial preferences. Sure. That's a serious problem. Mm -hmm. So uh, climate change deniers probably don't read uh, left, Green Left Weekly or... Uh, or the scientific literature. <laughs> or you the don't scientific even have literature. to read Green Left Weekly. Uh, sure. Very few people do, but you know, yeah. they, they, they wouldn't read the scientific literature and the scientific literature isn't being reported mm. uh, accurately by certain media organs. I mean, unfortunately, we do have a lot of evidence about that, that there's just a complete disjoint mm. between the scientific literature and the media coverage. Yeah. And um, yeah, and that is a serious problem. It's a serious political problem. So 
this, uh, this is related to false consensus. That is, mm -hmm. people um, falsely assuming that other people hold the same beliefs uh, by selectively focusing them, uh, selectively focusing or only reading certain types of literatures and so Absolutely. on. Absolutely, and there's again, there's evidence of that. Uh, for that, um, I'm thinking of one study that was done in Australia um, just recently involving a representative sample of 5,000 people. And again, they looked at climate change attitudes and they found that only about 6% of the population is denying that the climate is changing. However, those 6% think that their opinion is shared by 50% of the people. So even though they're a small minority, they think that their opinion is shared by half the people, when in fact it isn't. And what's particularly concerning about this is that um, the extent to which people overestimate the prevalence of their own opinion, that makes them more resistant to opinion change. Mm -hmm. Um, because one of the things that we know is that people do not want to be outsiders. They do not want to be seen as extreme. They do not want to hold opinions that are considered extreme. So um, their perceptions about what everybody else is thinking is actually extremely important because if they falsely believe that everybody else is sharing their opinion, well then they will cling to a very extreme position more easily. So. Um, and again, that is due to selective media exposure, people choosing their own media to, to listen to. And I think the solution to this ultimately has to be that people are somehow nudged towards opening up to take in other information as well, to break down these epistemological little bubbles mm -hmm. where people are sitting in their own little camps, consuming their own knowledge completely separate from, from the rest of society. Mm -hmm. So I suspect that uh, false consensus and um, looking at evidence and not exactly reading all the literatures and so on isn't just a matter for uh, climate change deniers. I'm, I would imagine no. that scientists are probably no. guilty of the same thing. Uh, well, I don't know that. Uh, I can't tell you what scientists are guilty of because uh, I haven't studied them much, uh, as much, but I can certainly tell you that these are general principles that mm -hmm. apply to, to everybody. People are social animals. Uh, people generally are driven by the opinion of others. Mm -hmm. So there is research to suggest that people's purchasing decision on Amazon are driven by reviews mm -hmm. by complete strangers, by mm -hmm. members of the public who have, you know, who say, oh yeah, that's a four star, five star, whatever. That's boosting sales. Mm -hmm. And it's really kind of, if you think about it, it's strange, isn't it? Because these are complete strangers. You have no idea what these people, who they are, why they feel that way about the book, mm -hmm. and yet it affects our decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is just an inherent tendency of people to look to others to, to search information. Mm -hmm. we're, we're driven as much or more by informants as we are by information. Mm -hmm. So as social animals, we look to others. And so all these principles of, of consensus being important, perceived consensus of others, uh, they apply across the board, mm -hmm. totally. Yep. Now, the topic of the course, uh, Think 101, is uh, the science of everyday thinking. And our goal in the course is to try to give people the tools, mm -hmm. um, the sort of methods that might help them improve their everyday mm -hmm. thinking. Um, I've had a long career of, of uh, looking at the tools of thinking, of cognition and uh, memory and learning, mm. uh, what would you recommend in terms of ways of improving uh, people's everyday thinking? Well, I think break out of whatever makes you happy. Mm -hmm. Do not just read things that make you happy because people agree with you. Uh, challenge yourself by stepping outside that. The internet is out there, you can go out there and you can go, if you're conservative, you can go to a liberal magazine or vice versa. Um, just make a point of breaking out of the tendency to satisfy your own needs. That sounds funny because of course we all want to be happy. We all want to read things that make us happy. But in the long run, we would all be better off if we uh, uh, breached out a bit more into 
you know, challenging territory. Challenge yourself to listen to what other people have to say. So that is one thing as a, as a citizen that uh, you can do. Um, I think the other thing that's important is for people to remember what they've been told in the past and to kind of keep track of whether that's actually panned out. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, again, to use one example that I've studied extensively, the uh, Iraq War, where people uh, thought, you know, vast majority of, of people in America thought that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Then after the country was invaded, none of them turned up. Um, now, you would think that that should change people's opinions. But as it turns out, for years and years after that, until I think it's recently, the most recent data I know is from about 2008 or 2010, so five or seven years after the uh, war commenced, mm -hmm. a large proportion of people still think that weapons of mass destruction were found in Iraq, when in fact that's not the case. Um, so that's, again, you know, think about what you were told, think about what you used to think, and entertain the possibility that actually, hang on, this didn't quite turn out that way, mm -hmm. and then analyze the implications of that. Mm -hmm. Now, we know from a lot of research that for people to let go of information they've initially encoded, the best way to achieve that is to provide them with an alternative explanation for the same situation, mm -hmm. okay? So rather than just saying, um, well, there weren't any weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, maybe explain to people why it was that there weren't any or why it was that they thought there might be some in the mm -hmm. first place. Um, try to explain what happened. People are very good at replacing one explanation with another mm -hmm. for the world but they're not good at letting go of an explanation without having an alternative. Mm -hmm. So you gotta provide an alternative scenario. It's very important to have an alternative script mm -hmm. for things that have happened. And then you can change your opinion. So people seem to have a, um, I think we've called it a, an anti-establishment bias in that sense that uh, the government, the um, scientists, mm. uh, people are trying to conspire mm. or uh, are trying to further their own interests mm. at the expense of the general public. Mm. Um, you've encountered that before, I assume? Um, well, that's a common element of conspiracy theories is that, you know, it's uh, <laughs> the official version is always wrong, uh, whether the official version is something that a government is putting out or a scientific body uh, or, or you know, in the case of vaccinations, the pharmaceutical industry, um, conspiracy theories always involve a rejection of an official account. And they always presume nefarious intent behind um, the, the official position. You know, the government or the pharmaceutical industry or scientists, they're out to screw you, yep. basically. That, yep. that is always the case. Yep. Um, and so it's just one way for people to reject a fact is by making up a conspiracy surrounding it. Because mm -hmm. that's one way out. If, if you cannot believe or do not want to believe that tobacco is bad for you because you're a chain smoker, well, then what are you going to do? How are you going to justify that? Yeah. Well, one answer is to say that all the medical scientists are conspiring. Um, because they want to deny you this fund. So they're making up all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So that is the purpose of conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. That is why people uh, believe in conspiracies. Mm -hmm. And getting back to your previous point, citing uh, their grandfather who smoked it every day of his life. Exactly. Precisely. They're, they're cherry picking one piece of supporting evidence while they're ignoring absolutely everything mm -hmm. else. That's also a characteristic of conspiratorial thinking. My name is Stephen. I think about misinformation.